Okay, in this video I'm going to continue on with my tutorial series discussing complex analysis. Specifically, this is video number 4 and I'm going to present a derivation of the divergence theorem. I'd like to draw your attention to my website, universityphysicstutorials.com. Here I have all my videos archived and listed, and I have a few other bits and pieces which may be of interest to you. Before we continue, it's useful to look at the previous videos to this one. We are obviously discussing complex analysis, and for that reason, my videos on complex numbers are very applicable. In video number one and video, excuse me, in video number one on my series in complex analysis, I discussed the Cauchy-Riemann equations. In videos number two and three, I presented two different derivations of Green's theorem. I noted that Green's theorem is related to the divergence theorem, and after deriving the divergence theorem in this current video. I will show the relationship between Green's theorem and the divergence theorem. So let's begin. I will try and present a reasonably simple derivation of the divergence theorem. It's probably useful to look at the result or the bottom line up front before we even begin. The divergence theorem relates a closed surface integral of a vector field, let's say the vector field is capital A, and it relates it to a volume integral involving the divergence of the vector field. You may remember that in Green's theorem we went from a closed line in integral to a surface integral. The divergence theorem is something similar except we're going from a closed surface integral to a volume integral involving the divergence of the vector field. Consider a three-dimensional volume, let's call it V, of a surface S and if the, the surface of course is in three dimensions so it's a function of x, y and z. So we're picking a volume and has a surface area, we're going to call that capital S. And let us try and evaluate the flux of a vector field, let's call the vector field capital A, through this particular volume. Now we know the flux is defined as the closed surface integral of your vector field dotted with the infinitesimal area element ds. Or we could say the infinitesimal flux element, d phi, is a dot ds. So the flux is the integral of d phi, which is the integral of a dot ds. Note, by the way, it is a closed surface integral. That is very important. It's the flow of the field through your, uh, through your volume. And the, the dot product picks out the component of your vector field, which is perpendicular to your surface. In other words, the, that's the part, that's the component which will flow through it. Because obviously if the component is parallel to your surface, then there would be no flow or flux through it. So the component has to be perpendicular. Moving on. Let's assume that we can break the volume up into infinitesimal volume areas. Volume elements probably shouldn't be areas, it should be elements. Volume elements, V sub i of surface area S sub i. So we have our closed surface integral here on the center left of your screen. And we're saying that we're going to assume that we can break this up into a sum. So the sum is going to be the limit of the sum of a sub i dot delta s sub i. That should make a lot of sense to you because it is essentially a Riemann sum. But both the surface area element and the uh, and the vector field itself are all in three dimensions. So we can really look at this as having three separate components in the x, in the y, and in the z. And we still look for the limit as delta s sub i approaches zero. So we're going to consider the flux of the vector field capital A through some area elements and move along the x-axis, varying x from x sub i to x sub n, where the area elements are cubic, then varying x will call us, cause us to sweep out a tube, or a, a volume which is a tube, and I will show you this in a moment. So just bear with me a moment here. This diagram, while it might look complicated, is not that complicated. Let's just pick a small area element, the one that I'm shading in here. Let's say this is a, a square area element. Now. If we vary, if we just hold 
y and z constant and vary x, let's say we go from here right up to here, what we will do is we will sweep out a tube or we will sweep out a volume which looks like a, uh, a, an angular tube like that. And this, this particular shape of course is inside the volume V which is bounded by the surface S. Now what we are going to consider are various cubic elements S sub I a function of course of x, y and z. Because this, this uh, shape which we're sweeping out here can clearly be broken down into a series of cubes, s, sub, uh, s a function of x, y and z. So let's say for example I have illustrated four such uh, elements here. We have f, s1, s2, excuse me, s3, s4, s sub n. Notice of course we are keeping y and z fixed and varying x. Now what we are going to do is select one of these particular cubes and just have a look at it in greater detail. So we're going to follow this down. So the volume of this particular, uh, the volume bound by this particular surface is going to be equal to delta x, delta y, delta z, or the change in volume is going to be delta x, delta y, delta z. That's just one of these particular cubes. Now they don't necessarily have to be cubic of course but it's easier for us to think about them as cubes. Now it's important to look at the normal component. Now let's remind us why it's important to do so. So let's imagine that we have a, a window pane here like this. There's our window pane and the rain is falling against our window pane like this. So any rain that comes down here can be broken up into having, let's say, a perpendicular component like this and a parallel component like this. Now, of course, all of the parallel components will not have rain, will say, penetrate your window if it was open. It would only be the perpendicular components or the components normal to your surface. So in order for us to look at flux or flow through a surface, we need to look at the perpendicular components or the normal components. So we're just going to look at this particular volume here in greater depth. Now we're varying along the X axis for the moment, keeping Y and Z fixed. Now, I've said a moment ago that positive X is in this particular direction here. So if you look at the face which is shaded in, in blue, the normal component will be outward towards you, the viewer. Now, but that is that is negative i hat. So the normal vector is negative i hat. Whereas if you're in the the face which I'm currently shading in in red, the normal vector there is going to be positive i hat. That is the outward normal positive i hat. So, at the face which is at x is equal to x sub one, we have the normal negative i hat. And at the face x is equal to x sub 1 plus delta x, we have a positive i hat normal vector to the face. Now, the infinitesimal surface area element, delta z, delta y, that's the scalar surface area element. The vector surface area element is delta y, delta z, n hat. And that's either going to be plus or minus, that should be a plus or minus, delta z, delta y, I hat for reasons we've explained already. So let us consider the flux through any of the plus or minus delta z delta y i hat faces as we vary x. Remember the flux is the closed surface integral of a dot ds but ds is the vector area or n hat ds. n hat is the outward normal so as, as you analyze the total flux, we're going to get some cancellation. And I'm going to describe that right now. So we are going to look at the flux between two particular phases separated by delta x in a little more detail. So I've drawn just one of our cubic area elements again. Now, if we look at this quite heavy gold line or dashed line, that represents the vector field A, going from the bottom left to the top right of your screen. It's going through one of our volume elements 
and we're going to analyze the flux through two surface elements along the x-axis where we kept the y and z vari variables fixed. So we have two faces to consider. The first face at the, we'll say the bottom as you can see, which is colored in in pink. And the second face, which is colored in in green. Now, as I said earlier on, in order to calculate the flux, we need to look at the outward normal. The outward normal for the pink face is going to be outwards towards you, the viewer. Whereas the outward normal of the face in green is going to be inwards into the screen. So we know that delta S sub X is going to be delta X, excuse me, delta Z, delta Y. So the, the infinitesimal area element or the, the vector infinitesimal area element delta S sub X is going to be N hat delta Z delta Y. Now we know that this N hat can be plus or minus I hat depending on the direction of the face. So delta S sub X, the vector surface area element is plus or minus I hat delta Z delta Y. Now let's see if we can contrast the flux at X is equal to X and the flux at X is equal to X plus delta X. The flux at X is at the bottom of your screen. Here we're looking at phi sub X, which is A sub X dotted with the vector area, surface area element. So that's A dot N hat delta S, but N hat in this particular case is here, and that's minus I hat. So we have minus A I hat delta Z delta Y. The next flux we look at is at x plus delta x. Something similar happens here, except this time we get plus a i hat delta z delta y at the position x plus delta x. In other words, the only difference here is going to be the value of a at that particular position, namely a at x plus uh, delta x and a at x. So let's say, for example, let's imagine that the value of a was fixed at those two points, then there would be a, a zero net flux. There would only be a net flux where the value of a or the value of our vector field changed. So let's go ahead and look at a number of these particular volume elements. I've just put a few of them together. If you want, you could imagine that this, this particular cube here is what we analyzed already. So we're gonna qu put quite a few of them together and we're looking at a number of faces. Now, as you can see, the faces that I've not shaded in, namely the one at the bottom here and the one at the top here, as we'll see in a moment, they're the ones that will contribute to the net flux. The ones inside will not contribute to the net flux, and I'll explain why. So let's look at the face at X1. So this face here that I'm coloring in at red. That is the first face and as a result, it's going to have some sort of a flux because that there's only one outward normal. However, if we move to, let's say, the face that I have colored it in green. Now, the outward normal on this face is there is an outward normal here due to the first surf or the first volume element, but there's also an outer normal here. So the point is that Whatever value that the field has at that point is going to be the same for both, we'll say, both faces, but the outward normals are equal and opposite, therefore you're going to get no net flux. Something similar is going to happen here and here, here and here, here and here. But when you get to the end of the tube, shall we say, or the end of our volume, there is no cancelling or cancellation to occur and therefore there is a positive flux contribution here because of the positive i hat and there is a negative flux contribution here due to the negative i hat. This is exactly what we saw already. So here I've written the, f the uh, vector field as a sub x n and at the very top it's a sub x n. I probably should have uh, maybe um, this should be I don't know, I might call it capital N, and I might call this small n. You know, it doesn't really matter. 
Now just in case that hasn't convinced you, and hopefully it does, I've written explicitly some of the flux uh, elements out here for a number of faces, in fact five faces, and you'll see that there's cancellation. That's not something I'm going to go through now, I'll just let you watch that if you like, or read through that if you like. So the sum of the flux through each face is really given by the flux at the last face and the flux at the first face. And because the unit normals are equal, or excuse me, are in the opposite directions, we're looking at the difference between them. So realistically, the flux is given by the difference in the value of the vector field at each point, multiplied by the surface area element, and it's in the, well in this case, it's in the i hat direction. Because we're holding x and, uh, or excuse me, holding y and z fixed, and varying x. Now I'm going to incorporate a bit of a sleight of hand and I'm going to multiply and divide by delta x and I'm sure you can see why I'm going to do this. If I multiply and divide by delta x we're going to get a delta x, delta y, delta z up here. Well, that's going to be your infinitesimal volume element, volume element dv or d tau as I usually call it. And we're going to get some sort of a partial derivative as well. So Looking at this here, this is, this is d tau, our infinitesimal volume element. Now delta x, what's delta x? That's nothing but, let's say, the value of x, the x at uh, whatever, I will say, your, your end point was, minus x at your start point. Now, I know I'm saying x plus 1, or n plus 1, but it's just the difference between two x's. It doesn't really matter which one they are. But because we are summing them, it's best to use the notation that I have at the bottom of the screen. So here we have still, we have our dx, dy, dz, or delta x, delta y, delta z, which will become our delta tau or d tau. Now delta x, because we're summing it, it's going to be x of n plus 1 minus x of n. And we're going to sum from n is equal to 1 to n is equal to capital N, which is the total number of faces, minus 1. And I'm sure you can convince yourself that this is in fact correct and makes perfect sense. If it doesn't, well then you can look at the calculation I've done here in gold and that should, uh, that should do it out more explicitly. That's something I'm not going to go through now though. The point here is that our flux, so the integral which we said can be given as the sum of the, fl the infinitesimal flux elements can be re rewritten in this form here which is equivalent to this form here. Now we're going to take we're going to use this particular form here. So we have the sum of small n is equal to 1 to small n excuse me capital N minus 1. We have the difference in the, the value of the vector field at the faces we divide it by the change in the x direction, we'll say, if we're, if we're looking along that direction. And we multiply it then, of course, by the infinitesimal volume element here. In the limit, where we our Riemann sum becomes an integral, of course, this is nothing but del a sub x dx integrated d tau. I'm going to call this equation number one. It should be pretty straightforward uh, to understand why this is in fact the case. It all stems from the fact that we could make this particular substitution or this particular uh, change up here. And like I said, if you're not convinced, look at the uh, explicit, um, explicit steps that I've done here in gold. But the point is that expression number one is only the first of three parts of the integral. In other words, we kept y and z fixed and varied x. What happens if we keep x and y fixed and vary z? Or keep x and z fixed and vary y? Well clearly we're going to get something similar. Just to recap, this is the expression we started with. But that's not something that uh, I'm sure you'll uh, need to look back on. The point here is that in the limit our sum of co our re it's a Riemann sum. That's going to become an integral. We're going to get the integral with respect to the infinitesimal volume element d tau. Del a sub x del x, del a sub y del y, del
del a sub z del z. Well, that's nothing else but the divergence of the vector field a. And if you need to go looking at the divergence, look at my videos in vector calculus for electromagnetism. And that's the divergence theorem. We've gone from a, a closed surface integral of a dot ds, and we've gone to the volume integral of the divergence of our vector field. This is one of the fundamental theorems for vector calculus for electromagnetism. Without vector calculus, we really can't do any electromagnetism. So um, it's something that's very important and it's very useful to do. And I would suggest that if you understand the origins of the divergence theorem, it'll help you significantly in your future uh, ma mathematical analysis. So thanks for watching. Please pass it on to your friends. Subscribe to my YouTube channel. You might also click on universityphysicstutorials.com. Thanks for watching.